Okay, episode 7, called Crosshairs. This one's starting to pick up, back up a little bit. Um, yeah, sorry, don't mind the glasses. Um, so this one's starting to pick back up a little bit. Uh, Frank and Micro go after this mortician that was one of the people that was helping to get the heroin out of Kandahar. Kandahar! As far as uh, this drug running operation, uh, that one was really the big story that was kind of laid out in Daredevil Season 2. And it's been touched on and kind of embellished a little bit more and uh, added to in this series. So they're going after the mortician that was there. He's a colonel, I forget his name. Spoilers, doesn't matter anymore. And kind of leads him to Agent Orange's house, which... Frank tries to take out Agent Orange and bulletproof glass. So it's kind of badass seeing this dude. And I knew that he looked familiar too. This guy's father in Tentola in The Sopranos. That's where I remember him from. And it he's just as eee, makes my skin crawl now as he did back then because I never cared for Father in Tentola. But uh, definitely a cool episode. On top of that, Madani's realizing that her office is bugged. So kind of uh, follows her and um, her buddy over there at Homeland kind of searching for the bug and kind of learning a little bit more about her and this one also I forgot to talk about the subplot with Lewis the the vet with PTSD he ended up killing that NRA fucker and almost killed himself and had kind of this heart-to-heart -heart moment with his dad where he's, his dad's trying to lay out some wisdom for him we, using uh, the old fight with George Foreman and Muhammad Ali as kind of like a um, metaphor for what he's talking about. And I'm not exactly sure, but I think Lewis killed his dad too. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see what goes on with that subplot as well. But the, the series is picking back up a little bit. I'm starting to feel amped. I'm starting to feel some excitement going on with these characters again. So uh, let's move on to episode 8 see what's going to happen then. Okay, that was one of the most disturbing things that I've seen this side of Requiem for a Dream. Um, that one was definitely a good episode, episode 8. Uh, dark involves a lot of alcohol so micro and Frank get drunk they told they tell their old war stories about how they met their significant others um, that basically is sparked by the internet going down at micro's house so that he can't watch his family like some sort of creepy cuck um, I get why he's doing it but at the same time dude let's be honest it's a little creepy so Frank goes over there his wife ends up kissing him, and he gets all sorts of shit-faced and jealous and whatnot. I mean, seriously, dude, come on. <laughs> she thinks you're dead for like a year. But that's, regardless, uh, definitely a fun episode in that respect. So the majority of the action comes from the end of the episode when Madani and her little buddy, uh, her assistant or whatever, I think his name is Stein, the gives some misinformation because they found the wiretap in Madani's office and essentially try to ambush this black ops group that is showing up because they think the black ops group thinks that they're going there to ambush and kill Frank Castle. Castle's got nothing to do with anything. Homeland Security is sitting there waiting for them and they take him out. There's a lot of casualties on both sides but one is left alive. He escapes and of course it's Billy so, he ends up killing her little buddy, and that is so sad, uh, because I really like the guy. And he, like, slices his throat, he tries to say something to Madani before he dies, but he can't get any words out, so... The only person that knows that Billy's a bad guy, he, he can't say anything, because, you know, he's dead. And then the episode ends in a really, really dark, disturbing, kind of one of those scenes that won't leave your mind um, 
Madani's in a bathtub, covered in blood, trying to wipe herself clean, shivering and obviously in shock, with Billy kind of washing her off. So she's being scrubbed clean with all the blood from the battle and a lot of the blood from her friend being scrubbed clean by the guy that killed her friend. The implications are fucked up and the implications are disturbing, but damn, this is compelling TV, man. I, I'm so glad they made this. This, this show is going for it. I'm really liking what we're getting. Uh, hell of an episode. Let's keep going. Episode 9's next. Okay, episode 9. Holy shit. That is one of, not probably not the, but one of the most powerful episodes of television I have ever watched. Um, the number one probably still goes to that one episode of Twin Peaks Season 3, but this is in the same ballpark to me. This one was definitely a powerful episode. A lot of major implications. It centered a lot on Lewis, the kid that I kept on forgetting in the beginning. I mean, honestly, I should have paid attention. I should have been talking about him more because I know how these Marvel shows go, man. Nothing's off limits until it is. So I just tacked it up to a filler storyline to stretch out the episode. It doesn't look like it was, man. I think that this kid might be around for a little while and might, may potentially be a big bad further on down the road. Um, because he is unhinged and he is crazy. He sets off bombs at three different locations targets Karen Page trying to get his message out and everything and then goes after Curtis and the shit that Frank Castle says to him when he has him dead to rights on the phone and he's just he just lays into him it, incredibly dark and patriotic the du the duality that was going on in this episode was incredible and now everybody knows that Frank Castle's alive so the shadow of him being dead and being able to operate in the shadows that's fucking gone. Oh, fuck. In this episode, this series is worth it. For, for this and episode three. This, this whole season has been worth it. So, let's, let's roll it out, man. We got three left to go. Three more. Let's check them out. Okay, now I can finally get a little bit critical. Uh, just finished episode 10, and, well, the upside is I haven't seen Run Lola Run in a really long time. Um, that is not my favorite trope that I've seen certain TV shows do. Very few of them have done it in this way, where they have the same story being told by different people with different types of events, their minor changes and everything. And I understand it because the episode is basically unfolding from the interrogation of all the survivors of this massacre at a hotel uh, involving Lewis, the crazed dude with the uh, PTSD from the last few episodes, who I thought was going to be a big bad. That is not going to be a situation anymore. Um, rather anticlimactic ending, if you ask me. Um, Frank Castle shows up. Madani now knows that Billy Russo's Billy the Baddie. Um, I'm still waiting for his name to be Jigsaw, because that'd be cool. I could make fun of that a lot. Um, I don't know. That that was that was one episode that I was not a fan of. It's being like I said, it's being told from different points of view. So it's the same story being told in a couple of different ways, a couple of different times, from different points of view, um, and all the while it's from different people's perspectives. So you're getting to see what was going on in this hotel. And realistically, if they just streamlined the story, it probably would have only taken about 20 minutes and we could have gotten a lot more awesome out of the deal. I don't know. I, they made a choice. They were effective. I mean, the action was good. The acting was on point, as always. I mean, everybody's doing phenomenal with the roles in this series. But, I don't know. That particular episode, not a fan. I just didn't care for it. But we got three left, so let's power through! Okay, well this show is getting down to the cream now. Um, just finished up with episode 11, and two more to go after this one. Badass episode. 
amazing firefight at the end. A uh, great shootout. Frank hiding guns all over the place like he's Kevin McAllister in Home Alone, only, you know, instead of micro machines and paint cans, they're automatic weapons and shotguns. So, badass episode. Badass episode. Uh, the new CIA director basically just threw down with Agent Orange. So I have a feeling she's probably going to go bye-bye because I don't think Agent Orange is going to go down without a fight quite that easy. Billy Russo, fucking snake. Um, Madani's in. Uh, best, best part of the episode to me, though, was Russo sending those contract killers after uh, Lieberman's wife and two kids. The daughter hides out upstairs, so she's able to escape and get away safe. The mom and the son... They are taken hostage, but, oh my god, such a badass scene. Then Lieberman ends up exposing himself to his daughter. Okay, that came out wrong. Um, <laughs> Lieberman ends up confessing to his daughter that he is, in fact, still alive, goes and rescues her. Very emotional, very touching scene. Man, th this episode is what The Punisher is all about, in my opinion. It it's about vengeance. It's about retribution. It's about the blurred line between right and wrong. Some of the dialogue, specifically between Agent Orange and the CIA director, it shows just how gray that line can be. This is why The Punisher is good, man. Because it... Everything from the PTSD case kid with the bombs and everything to con little conversations, little clandestine encounters on a dark secluded bridge in the middle of New York City in the middle of the night. So many tiny snippets of conversation. So many metaphors. So many characters that just embody one way of thinking while being confronted with an external force, uh, which is the counterpoint to that argument. There's so much gray in this show, and that's what I like about it. You know, I, just the nature of Frank Castle himself. Is he a good guy or is he a villain? Is he a vigilante? Is he an anti-hero? Is he the hero that certain people may need, or is he just, in fact, a cold-blooded killer? Uh, and it's left for you to decide. That episode was really good. I, I, I'm liking this. Two more to go, man, and then we'll give our final thoughts for the season. Whew. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that episode was dark. That episode was awesome. Um, and, but that episode might have crossed a line. So the core of this episode centered around the torture of Frank Castle by Agent Orange and Billy Russo to protect them from having all of their dealings and all of their shady enterprises gone public and to protect them from Homeland Security and from public scrutiny to basically save their lives as they know it. To, essentially to save their lives in general. And especially Orange, he'll go to any length to get what he wants. And I want to know what the fuck those gloves are made out of, dude. I mean, whoa. Holy shit. These gloves were made special for you. And then he just starts smacking the shit out of them. Um, this episode was brutal. Not for the faint of heart. It, it almost even had an art house feel to it in a couple of ways. Um, by that, I mean when Frank's getting tortured, he goes to his happy place. Which... He's making love to his wife for a good portion of it. Um, you're seeing through his eyes how much he truly loves her. Um, she's basically got the crossover, Frank. You're welcome. You're welcome in the light scenario going on. And he doesn't go. He doesn't cross over. He stays and fights. He has, he has a mission to fulfill. And even though that mission is violence, death, and justice, or justice, it's more like vengeance than justice he he stays he doesn't cross over um this episode was badass man uh definitely in keeping with how violent and how unapologetic this series has been but like i said i i think i'm gonna have to marinate on this one as to whether or not it may have crossed a line somewhere uh not 
not necessarily cross a line for me as far as whether or not I liked it, because I definitely did, but <laughs> I like th I like gritty comic book shit. I really do. But that wasn't gritty. That was that was violent. Holy shit! And it reveled in it, but not for the fun type of revelry. It it was appropriate to the story. I think the more I'm talking about it, the more I'm thinking it didn't actually cross any lines because how else would a story like this end and end satisfyingly? Uh, it can't all be na wrapped up in a nice, pretty package with a nice bow uh, like the Lieberman storyline so far. I mean, granted, we've got one episode. There's plenty of time for shit to go wrong. But how else could a story like this end if not for blood and violence and death? and eye gouging. I swear to God, man, I'm seeing King Lear in my head. So, one episode left. Let's see how this story is going to end. So, just like Daredevil taking down Kingpin, just like Jessica Jones taking down uh, Kilgrave, just like Luke Cage taking down both of his big bads in his show, a fantastic finale. Absolutely fantastic finale. Frank squares off against Russo, turns him into what I guess is going to be, potentially in the future, Jigsaw. Because mango Spoilers, like... Well, I don't need to say spoilers at this point. You're at the finale. Spoilers are assumed at this point. Uh, turns him into what I'm assuming is Jigsaw. Mangles his fucking face. Uh, at the end, you're seeing him at the hospital. He looks like Dark Man. So I, and it was poetic too, because it takes place, the, the final confrontation takes place where it all began. It's taking place right there at the carousel where his family was gunned down in that gang violence that was orchestrated by essentially these two men, Agent Orange and Russo. Uh, Agent Orange now completely dead, Russo mangled beyond repair. Could wake up, could not wake up, is what they're saying at the end. Could remember everything, could remember nothing. I think that we're in the midst of seeing an awesome, badass villain in Jigsaw. Because you know he's coming back. You know he's coming back. Uh, so the majority of this episode dealt with that, and the setup, and the premise. We got to see Curtis one last time, him being used as a pawn, and seeing him right at the very end. Uh, we got to see some closure with Lieberman and his family, a.k.a. Micro. Got to see some closure with his family, um, them making him this beautiful, delicious spread to come home to, because he's finally back with his family. And the episode ends with Frank finally joining Curtis's little support group and talking about the thing that really scares him, and that's the time after the gunfire, that, that silence after the gunfire. How do you go on living after all of this? And that was poetic. That was that was deep. Uh, and in my opinion, it's foreshadowing for what's to come. So, one hell of a season finale, I'll say that. Alright, so final thoughts on this season. Or series, standalone series. I'm hoping that this is just going to be a season. Because I would love for them to do more of this. My final thoughts? If Punisher is what we're getting with a standoff, I'd suck dick for Ghost Rider. That is what I'm saying. I This this show, just like all of the other Marvel shows, has its ups and it has its downs. Uh, Jessica Jones, in my opinion, is the best one that they've done to date. And even Jessica Jones had its issues. I think I feel like they went off on kind of a tangent with the whole nuke storyline and everything. There's probably two or three episodes that they could have negated. Um, the Hand in um, Daredevil Season 2, Punisher should have been the full big bad in that season, you know, between Punisher and Elektra, and save the Hand for Season 3, or, you know, introduce the Punisher, just have him kind of glimpse around and primarily focus on the Hand. That one felt a little bit do too discombobulated. Luke Cage... Luke Cage was a phenomenal show, but two shorter seasons 
lumped into one big season. It it just didn't work for me because they blew their load with Cottonmouth and then tried to build up Diamondback and then ultimately gave us Diamondback. Punisher didn't do that. Punisher harkened back to season one of Daredevil where you've got the one continuous story going forward instead of the branch off stories. Yeah, it had its side plots and whatnot, but it didn't it didn't have to share its focus like what we've been seeing with a lot of these other ones. Um, Iron Fist is a good example too. Iron Fist did primarily focused on its main core story. Um, Iron Fist had a litany of its own problems, but Iron Fist had that too, but Punisher is not Iron Fist. Punisher is much more in line with season one of Daredevil. The story is streamlined. The characterization is excellent. The I cared about what was going on here, and the amazing episodes took care of me so that I didn't care as much about the episodes that I felt fell flat on its face. Season uh, Episode 1, pretty damn slow. Pretty damn slow. I Especially, like, the first two-thirds of it. And then that one run, Lola run episode, I just didn't work for me. They made a choice. They stuck to that choice. That's great. It just didn't work for me. For other people, it might have worked for. I didn't like uh, Jesse Eisenberg's version of Lex Luthor. Didn't feel like Lex to me. It felt more like the Riddler. But he made a choice. He followed it through. I just didn't like it. So, plenty of people are going to like that episode. I'm just not one of them. Oh, as a whole, this was... This is how you should do a spin-off series. This is what you should do. And Netflix is taking care of these Marvel properties, man. They're making them dark, gritty. They're making them say something. They're taking a stance by giving the debate. They're not championing one side of the argument or one side of the mentality. And by that, I'm talking about gun control. I'm talking about firearms. I'm talking about that whole debate, especially in the wake of what happened in Las Vegas and what happened in Texas. This show does not take a pro-gun stance, and it certainly doesn't glorify it, man. It certainly does not glorify it. If you, if you are of the impression that Frank Castle is somebody that should be revered or looked up to, then there is something seriously wrong with you. Because, I don't know, I feel like John Bernthal did, did, an, did an amazing job of showing a very flawed, very on the cusp of being evil character. And I've said it multiple times in, in several of the aspects of this review. I don't even know if I would consider him an anti-hero. I think I would consider him more a villain to root for, akin to Walter White or Tony Soprano. So, definitely, definitely recommend this show, man. Two very enthusiastic thumbs up. Hands down, man. Netflix, do more of this. Do more of this, Netflix. Give us more spin-offs, man. Give us Ghost Rider. I will fly down to Disney and I will blow who I need to to get Ghost Rider made in a way that Punisher was. So I hope that some of these reviews have been a little bit enlightening for you guys. Um, let me know if you agree. Let me know if you disagree. Let me know if you think that the show is a piece of shit. Let me know if you think that I'm on the right path with how I feel about it. Let us know in the comments down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And hopefully you guys like me doing this episode by end episode binge thing. Um, I set this up to be in vlog form as opposed to uh, much more of the quick cuts and doing bits like we're doing with a lot of these other reviews. And honestly, it was kind of fun. Watch an episode, review it. Watch an episode, review it, and then kind of talk about it all at the end. Um, and also, we're going to be talking about this show in much more detail at the Nerdy Nomicon podcast. You can find that wherever you listen to podcasts or honestly right here in this YouTube feed because they're down there as well. So again, like, Comment, subscribe. See you later.